أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم أنا الحمد لله نحمده ونستعينه ونستغفره ونعوذ بالله من شرور أنفسنا ومن سيئات اعمالنا من يهده الله فلا مضل له ومن يضلل فلا هادي له واشهد ان لا اله الا الله وحده لا شريك له واشهد ان محمدا عبده ورسوله صلوات الله والسلام عليه يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن الا وانتم مسلمون يا ايها الناس اتقوا ربكم الذي خلقكم من نفس واحده وخلق منها زوجها وبث منهما رجالا كثيرا ونساء واتقوا الله الذي تساءلون به والارham ان الله كان عليكم رقيبا يا ايها الذين امنوا اتقوا الله وقولوا قولا سديدا يصلح لكم اعمالكم ويغفر لكم ذنوبكم ومن يطع الله ورسوله فقد فاز فوزا عظيما اما بعد فان خير الكلام كلام الله وخير الهدى هدى رسول الله وشر الامور محدثاتها وكل محدثه بدعه وكل بدعه ضلاله وكل ضلاله في النار we begin today's lecture appropriately by mentioning what you just heard and it's not new to most of you and it's called khutbatul haja that the nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to teach his companions with the same emphasis that he would place on teaching them the quran now that we're going to talk about one of the greatest ulama of the 20th century during our time in our era the sheikh nasiruddin al albani it's only appropriate to do all of khutbah al-haja from the beginning to the end it's not wajib to start a class off or the khutbah of al-eid or al-juma it's not wajib to say khutbah al-haja but because the nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam used to say it many times most of the times it's appropriate and it's also appropriate secondarily because we follow the nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam unconditionally but we also follow the imams of al islam we take them as examples and from those imams is muhammad nasiruddin al albani who wrote a book he wrote a book explaining the benefits of khutbatul haja the meaning of khutbatul haja the importance of the da'wah of tawhid in khutbatul haja and al ittiba and i'tisam following the sunnah of the nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam so when i began khutbah al haj i didn't come here thinking to do the whole thing but when i was staying studying in al madina in the mid 90s early in the late in the mid 80s to the beginning of the 90s the dawa of as salafia by the efforts of muhammad nasir al albani was touching everybody all over the place and even in this masjid and almost every masjid that you go in i gave a khutbah yesterday in a masjid in darby i never been that masjid before almost every masjid that you go to where the people are trying to have some concern for the sunnah even if they don't claim as salafia but people are trying to have some concern for the sunnah you're going to pray with people who are doing things in the salat that al albani rahimahullah ta'ala had a lot to do with that knowledge and information being spread that knowledge and that information emphasis being put upon it only allah subhanahu wa ta'ala who knows all of the details of the hidden and the manifest he knows how much al albani has helped this ummah only allah ta'ala knows but anyone who has eyes to see and he has some intellect and some ears and he has fairness and justice without going overboard for or against anyone who has those faculties he's going to acknowledge and recognize this man rahimahullah ta'ala had a lot to do with reviving the sunnah of the nabi sallallahu alaihi wasallam 
And unlike many of the ulama who we love, honor, and respect from all of the madahib, from every country in the Muslim world during our time and before our time, but we're talking specifically during our time, those scholars, they have been described as, one of them is described as al-alama, the big scholar. He's an alam, an alama. But it is al-albani who has been described as being a mujaddid, a mujaddid. The Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam mentioned an authentic hadith, inna Allah yab'athu ala kulli mi'ata sana. He said, every 100 years, Allah Azza wa will send forth someone who's going to revive this ummah. Every 100 years, someone is going to be sent to make tajdeed. Not that El Islam became old or El Islam died, but something will happen in this ummah where, where the, the religion that the Nabi was on, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and his companions, the community will be falling short of the mark in different aspects. And Allah will always send a reviver to renew and to call the people back to that which was known during the time of Rasulullah Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. So the first mujaddid of this ummah, according to most of the ulama of Ahlul Hadith, the very first one, the first one ever sent was the great scholar Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. Umar ibn Abdul Aziz. And then after him, people came in fiqh. He's a mujaddid in hadith. He's a mujaddid in jihad. He's a mujaddid in the luga. He's a mujaddid and so forth and so on. Many of the ulama of al-Islam considered al-Albani not just to be a scholar, but to be a mujaddid. Something about his personal life, and a lot can be said, is that he was a white man. Al-Albani was from Albania. He wasn't an Arab, even, wasn't even an Arab. He grew up in Albania. He was born, rahimahullah ta'ala, in the year 1914, and he died in the year 1999. So he lived for 85 years. The reason why I emphasize the khwani that he was a white man is to say that now a religion is irrelevant if the person is white or black, it's irrelevant. Man or woman is irrelevant. Rich or poor is irrelevant. As Allah Ta'ala mentioned in the Quran, Inna kramakum indallahi atqaakum, the best of you with Allah is the one who has the most taqwa. Those ulama who we know from the ulama of al hadith, like the Qutb al Sitta, Al Imam al Bukhari, Al Imam Muslim, Abu Dawood al Tirmidhi, Al Nasa'i ibn Majah, all of those individuals were not Arabs. And there are many, many ulama in al-Islam, they were not Arabs. And there are many ulama in al-Islam who were Arabs, like al-Imam Ahmed, al-Imam al-Shafi, al-Imam Malik, rahimahumullah. So you're going to get good from ha'ula'i, and you're going to get good from ula'ika. You're going to get bad from ha'ula'i, and you're going to get bad from ula'ika. Another very important point that we want to point out concerning al-Imam al-Albani being a white person is the fact that it goes to show that one of the leading stars, who I perceive as being the number one leading star in the 20th century concerning the spread of the Sunni and Salafia. That leading star, one of the leading stars, he wasn't an Arab, which goes to dispel the misunderstanding that some people may have that knowledge is only inside of Saudi Arabia. Knowledge is only inside of the Gulf states. There is knowledge. In Pakistan, there are ulama of the Sunnah in Pakistan. There are ulama of the Sunnah in Nigeria, in Senegal, in Gambia. There are ulama of the Sunnah all over the place, in Indonesia. So we, as a community, especially the youngsters here, we have to be careful of falling into this concept that is decrepit and it is not consistent with reality, that knowledge is only located in Saudi Arabia. Al-Imam Al-Albani, this personality, many of you brothers, especially you youngsters, many of you, you may have heard of Al-Albani, but I tell you, the fact that Al-Albani has died for a number of years, 1999, he died, many of us have come and we just got a whiff of his name. 
We don't know how he was and how his dawah was. And today, today, in 2013, there are those people from the people of knowledge, ulama, who some of the people from our community really praise them. And rightly so, they deserve to be praised. But not on the level of Al-Albani. When Al-Albani was here, the Salafi community all across the globe, along with Al-Imam ibn Baz, Al-Imam ibn Uthaymeen, the Salafi community across all of the globe, they had three individuals who were really competent and qualified to be the instructors of the people. They don't deserve ghulu going overboard, but they did deserve people when they heard the name Al-Albani, the person has some veneration for him. Today, we have that same veneration for people who are not on the level of Al-Albani, nor, nor the teaching method that Al-Albani implored. The teaching method of those three Gary scholars, including the Sheikh Muqbil, who was younger than them. But the point is, people are being praised and raised to a level that those imams before them, although they didn't allow it, they didn't allow it, they were more deserving of it than what we find here today. Al Imam Al Albani, rahimahullah ta'ala, in his early life, he used to, as I mentioned, live in Albania. And the people were secularist in Albania at that time. The leader of Albania, Al Islam, was being something that was not popular. The Muslims were weak to this very day. You meet an Albanian Muslim many times, you won't see the remnants of Al-Islam. Not all of them, but Islam is da'if in that area. And Albani's father saw the need to make hijra with his children and his family to leave Albania. And he went with his family to Syria. And that's where Al-Albani was able to learn the Arabic language and he was a prolific person in the Arabic language. His father was actually one of the leading scholars of the Hanafi Madhab. And he taught his son, Hamid Nasr al-Din al-Albani, Tajweed of the Quran. He taught him the fiqh according to the Hanafi Madhab. He taught him also the different alat and the different tools and utensils that the student needs to know that he needs to have and grasp concerning the Arabic language. At an early age, the age of 20, he began to specialize in al-Hadith and the different sciences that were connected to al-Hadith. The very first project that he started to approach and in a way where he tried to get away from blind following and he tried to engage his mind in the mind of those people who were around him. When he first to excel academically, he dealt with one of the most important books in Al-Islam, one of the most used books in Al-Islam. So a book that has a lot of good in it and it has some problems in it as well. The people of the Turq al-Sufiyya rely on the book and it's none other than the book of Al-Imam Al-Ghazali Rahimahullah Ta'ala Ihya Ulum al-Din This is one of the most famous books in Islam it has some good stuff in it and it has some problems in it as well things that people can take from the book and support innovation and even support shirk and so forth and so on one of the great scholars of Al-Islam Al-Imam Abdul Rahim Ibn Hussein al-Iraqi, al-Hafid al-Iraqi. He wrote a book called Al-Mughni, in which he made the takhrij, and he gave where are the ahadith that were in this book, Ulum al-Quran. Al-Ghazali's book has a number of ahadith in it. Al-Imam al-Iraqi, who's a muhaddith, he came, and he started to take those hadith out, just the hadith, not the other kalam of the book. And he dealt with that. Al-Albani came, and he dealt with that book right there. And he started to grade those ahadith, over 5,000 hadith. When he did that, rahimahullah ta'ala was quite apparent, it was quite clear that Allah ta'ala blessed him with deep knowledge, deep insight, and a mail towards the knowledges of the hadith of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. In the year 1960, Al-Imam Al-Albani became popular in Syria. The Syrian government has always been secular and problematic. They have for a long time been opposed to the Sunnah and what's right. The stuff that you're seeing in Syria right now, for any Syrian and any Arab from the Arab world, 
people are not surprised. The son of the president before him, they're similar in the way that they deal with Muslims. In the 1960s, Al Albani started to write and he became popular. The Syrian government became aware of him and they became afraid of him as they were afraid with any cleric at that time who had something to say other than the clerics of innovation, kufr, and bid'ah. So they begin to put Al Imam Al Albani under surveillance. He saw there was going to be a problem. He became more well known. So the great eminent scholar Sheikh Ibn Baz, he was the vice president in the university there in Medina, Al Jamiat Al Islamiyya. When it first started, they realized and they recognized and they acknowledged the position of Al Albani. So they brought him to Al Medina, and he came to Al Medina and he started to teach. And not only was he a teacher during that time when it first started, that blessed university, but he sat on the board of the other ulama and the directors who made the decision to bring Muslim youth from all over the world in order to spread the correct understanding of Al-Islam. They did not compel anybody. You came from Gambia, you came from Senegal, you came from Pakistan, you came from India. They did not compel you to get off of your madhab. But what they did in the subject of al-fiqh, they came up with a way of teaching what's known as comparative religion, comparative fiqh, comparative fiqh, where they would take those issues and give all of the positions of the madhahib and let you, the student, decide and determine which was the best position based upon the dalil. So Al-Imam Al-Albani had a lot to do with the way the university was at that particular time. When he was there in al Medina, something happened that is really important concerning the history of Al-Albani because he's unique. He's unique when you look at his history and his dawah. When he went to Saudi Arabia, you know this myth of Al-Wahhabi, Al-Wahhabi. We mention many times, we don't believe in this stuff, Al-Wahhabi, that bro, we say the Ubandis and these people, Sufis, Wahhabi. These people are calling to a tawheed. Al-Imam Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab is not infallible, he's not masoom, and we don't blindly follow him. But he had a lot with eradicating shirk in the Arabian Peninsula. He had a lot to do with many of the students and many of the people who were affected by his dawah going to West Africa and also waging war against the shirk and kufr like Uthman bin Fodil, who throughout West Africa, that dawah of a tohi spread. And Imam al shokani in al Yemen, the people were cursing the companions and doing all kind of stuff, worshiping graves and other than that. And Imam Muhammad ibn Ali al shokani was affected by him. Scholars who came from Algeria, from Libya, these people, they were impacted and affected from India. They were affected. Muhammad Sadiq Hassan Khan, affected by Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahab. The point is, when Al Albani arrived in Arabia, he criticized some of the positions and opinions of the so called Wahhabis. And that's a myth. There's no thing called Wahhabism. But those ulama who were in Arabia, some of them, were staunch on certain positions. Even Al Imam al Shokani from Al Yemen, he used to write letters to some of the followers of Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, and he used to tell them, It is not acceptable for you to make blanket takfir against any and every Muslim who worships a grave. Maybe he's worshiping in the grave without knowledge. So sometimes, because of the fervor to spread a tawheed, some of them were quick to brand some people excommunicated from Al-Islam. And Imam al made in car on this, and rightly so. Al-Albani did the same thing when he went to Arabia. He saw some of the positions in his opinion were not supported by the strong delil, but some of the ulama were taking the position of the madhat. Now, this masjid right here is a masjid jam'iyat Ahlul Hadith. Ahlul Hadith are all over the world. They're in this country. Some of our imams and some of these masajid of Ahlul Hadith, they are strong like that. There are some positions that you'll find the imam from Pakistan taken, like reciting behind the imam, Surah Al-Fatiha. It's an issue of ikhtilaf. Whoever says you have to recite Al-Fatiha behind the imam, he has dalil. Whoever says you don't have to recite the Quran, the Fatiha behind the imam, he has dalil. But the one who says 
This is what Al Hadith are known for. And that's why I'm la, not like that. You have to take and look at both sides and then take the position that you're convinced is the strongest one. If the person looked at the Dalil and he said, reciting that Fatiha behind the Imam is the strongest position, in my opinion, and he doesn't get upset with the other opinion, then that's not blameworthy. But Al Albani was against that type of taqlid and that type of being being very stern and with no flexibility. When he did that, he started getting problems from some of the scholars and some of the people in Arabia. One of the things that he did was, as most of you know, in Arabia, better than most Muslim countries is the way their women dress. Not only the way their women dress, but the position that their women have in society is better than Libya. And there are men in Libya who are taking care of their women. It's better than Pakistan. And there are Pakistanis who take care of their women. I'm talking about in society in general. The Gulf states, the Muslim women in the Gulf state, the Europeans, Westerners want to say that they are oppressed. Those people to this day, it appears that their women are in a better condition than most women from this ummah. And Al-Bani disagreed with the thing about the niqab. He said, I don't think that it's wajib. And he wasn't quiet about it. He wrote books about it. And he used to challenge people to come. You don't have to take my position, but let us discuss the issue based upon Dalil. He wasn't a yes man. He wasn't afraid of people. And that's one of the characteristics that everybody would acknowledge about Hamid Nasr al-Din al-Albani. He did not care who you were with respect, not with arrogance. He didn't care how much money you had. He didn't care what level you were. He dealt with people properly, but he didn't hide his opinion. Whatever he thought was the truth, that's what he put out in the public domain. When he did that concerning some fifth issues, he started to have some problems with some of the people there. And it ultimately led to him not renewing his contract in the university, and he left Al Medina, and he went back to Syria. When he went back to Syria, he was arrested as a number of people were arrested. He was arrested. Some time went by, he got out of the prison, and Imam ibn Baz, rahimahullah, again got involved and brought Al Imam Al Albani back to Saudi Arabia. We began to work in Mecca, and he was working in the institution of a Sharia, and again, his knowledge began to spread all over the place once again, but he was not without his enemies. He was not without his enemies. Unfortunately, there were people who had jealousy against Al-Imam Al-Albani because that's just what's going to happen. If a person has something that Allah Ta'ala has given him in the way of a ni'mah, there's going to be other people who are not happy with that particular issue. So he had a number of people who were against him and once again, he left. Al-Albani went back to Arabia to perform Umrah and to meet the people that he knew in 1998. And we were studying at that time. We had heard about him. Every week at that time, there were some tapes that were coming. For those of you who don't know, he had a student by the name of Abu Layla. Abu Layla, he started taping all of the sit-ins with Al-Albani. If people came to visit him, he would tape it and you can hear the discussion. If someone came to debate him, he would tape it and you can hear the debate. If Al Albani went to someone's house to eat or someone came to one of his students' house, the students got together, there was a wedding, he would tape that. And from those tapes, the world started to become exposed to him. Every two or three days, you would get three or four tapes coming to Medina. The students were waiting for those tapes as if they were something that was precious. We got to hear the names and the voices of his students. We got to see how he was discussing and dealing with all kinds of people. His debates with Tekfiri people. His debates with people from, from Hizbu Tahrir. All kinds of issues. Anyway, the point is, 1998, he came to Al Medina, and at that time he was asked in a majlis, are you upon the Zahiri Medhab? The four madhabs, and then one of the lesser known madhabs is the Vahiri madhab. It's bona fide, respected madhab, has its issues, but nonetheless, Al Imam ibn Hazm was upon that madhab, and no doubt, Al Imam ibn Hazm is weighty in the religion. But the madhab have some problems. Some people said that Al Albani 
affirmed and say yes, that it was from that medhab on that medhab, which is a controversial medhab, but it's not true. I personally asked a number of his students who said, Al Imam al Albani was not connected to any of the well known madhahib. He respected each and, one, each and every one of those madhabs, but his dawah was to a tajreed. A tajreed, let dalil. A tajreed means to strip yourself naked, meaning to take your emotions and your desires out of the equation and to take a position solely based upon the dalil. What is the proof saying? Irregardless of what the elders said, irregardless of what the madhab said, irregardless of what your imam said, irregardless of what's popular, what did the dalil say? So it doesn't appear that he was upon any of those madhahib. Many other things can be mentioned, Ikhwani, concerning the life of Al-Imam Al-Albani in that regard. I just want to mention very quickly before we give you a glimpse into the Salafi of Al-Imam Al-Albani. The ulama of this century who were worth something, qualified, competent, those ulama had words of praise for Al-Imam Al-Albani. And as we mentioned, Al-Imam Al-Shafi'i rahimahullahu ta'ala, he said, pleasing all of the people is something that is impossible. There's no one who's going to please all of the people. Al-Imam Al-Bukhari didn't please all of the people. Ibn Taymiyyah didn't please all of the people. Abu Bakr Umar didn't please all of the people, radiallahu anhumah, and Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam didn't please all of the people. If the prophets and the messengers were unable to please all of the people because that's not the goal and the objective of their dawah, then clearly you and I won't be able to please all of the people and al Albani won't please all of the people. He has some serious enemies who had animosity towards him to the point where someone paid a man to physically beat him up. And he was beat up in the street of Syria. Beat down and beat up. Ignorant man was given some money by a Sufi man. He approached Al Imam Al Albani, a man who spent 60 years serving the Sunnah of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allah knows the effect that writing in those days with the pen, the struggle that he used to have, writing with the pen. The man, young man, went and beat the old man up in the street. So he had enemies. He's about to make the salat. He's in the salat. The man gets ready to make the takbir, the imam, Sufi. He turns around. He sees Al Albani in the line. In front of all of the people, he tells him, get out, get out. And he's screaming at him in the masjid that he can't pray in the line. There were many people due to ignorance, due to ignorance of their shiuch who were threatened of what they represented. Some of the enemies of Al Imam Al Albani, who were well known, or some of these people who are Jahmiyyah. I find it really difficult to comprehend that we have Jahmiyyin doing this day. The Jahmi, they were a group of people who used to explain away all of the names and the attributes of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. They were two brothers, Ahmed and Abdullah. Ahmed and Abdullah. as well as Abu Ghudda Abdul Fattah al ghumairi These people were against him. Recently in Syria, the biggest scholar of Syria, his name is Muhammad Ramadan Saeed Bulti. Ghafar Allahu lana wa lahu. This man was blown up a few months ago. Someone put a bomb in the masjid and they blew him up while he was talking. He supported the Syrian government and he praised the Syrian president. And he was a problem concerning the Sunnah and concerning the people of the Sunnah in Syria. And other than that, he was a big opponent of Al Albani who made dua against him. That Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will make his end one that he deserves. Allah knows best. Did that dua come true or not? My point is in his history, he had a lot of enemies from the people of the Sunnah, unfortunately, due to envy and jealousy. And obviously from people of innovation due to his dawah and understanding of Islam being diametrically opposed to their dawah. We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to forgive and have Rahman al-Imam al-Albani 
and to forgive and to have rahmah upon those people who opposed him and to put the Muslims, inshallah ta'ala, in the Jannah al firdos Concerning the Salafi of Al Albani, Khwani, a Salafi, as we mentioned, is the truth. But to call ourselves Salafi because we understand the theory of a Salafiyah, Kitab, Sunnah, according to the standard of the Sal of the Ummah, that's really beautiful. But very seldom will we get people who exemplify that claim. Do we see walking examples amongst us who show the Rahmah that the Prophet ﷺ had for people? For people who were ignorant, people who made mistakes, in the way that we deal with each other. Those scholars who we mentioned them, Ibn Baz, Ibn Uthaymeen, Sheikh Muqbir, Rahimahumullah, and Al-Bani, one thing that they used to have in completeness is with Allah and from Allah is, you saw in what they were saying, the same call and behavior that their tongues made. When we were getting to know Al -Al Imam Al-Albani, I personally never heard in Arabia, and this is not a criticism, it's about Al-Albani. I never heard the lectures, the khutbas, the cassette tapes of any of the speakers. There was no one at that time who we heard who cried more than Al-Albani. And simple things that would happen. And Imam al-Albani would be in a car, someone would come up to him, impressed and pleased, and he met al-Albani, would say, Yo, Nasruddin al-Albani, I'm, I'm happy to meet you. Al-Albani would cry, and just, just like that, and say, it is worthy of the individual to beware of being happy when people point to him and recognize him. Stories that are well known from his students and people who dealt with him. Those of you who know Arabic, you go to that internet YouTube and you put, you put in tape number 500. 500 of Abu Layla's series. Tape number 500 of the Algerian lady who called El Albani. He used to tape some of the calls people would call all over the world to get fatwas. Lady called him from Algeria. She said, Sheikh, I have a dream. I want to tell you about the dream. She was following Salafi lady. She was following what the Prophet ﷺ taught us. If you have a dream, tell your dream to someone with knowledge for the interpretation. Tell it to someone with knowledge. Don't tell it to some charlatan. Don't tell it to ignorant people. The lady called them. I want to tell you the dream. He said, what's the dream? And you could tell he was busy. What's the dream? The lady said, I saw the Nabi ﷺ in my dream. And he was walking down a path. And he walked down the path and he disappeared down the path. And I wanted to know, where did he go? So my friend in the dream, a lady was on the balcony. She called out to me and said, who was that sheikh? She said, when the prophet walked down the path, there was a man, a sheikh, walking behind him looking for him. My friend from the balcony said, who was that sheikh following Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam? The lady said, sheikh, you were that sheikh. I told my friend, that's Muhammad Nasruddin al-Albani. It was just a dream. The lady said, and then after that, you can hear on the recording, Al-Imam al-Albani started crying profusely. He couldn't stop crying. Wallahi ikhwani, when I, when we heard that, and we used to sit together and we used to listen to the different lectures, he would be talking about anything. It could be anything. A debate, a discussion, a dinner, anything. Here's a lady calling about a dream. When he broke down and he started crying like that, everybody was impacted by that. We don't find that anymore. Now when people cry, now when people cry, some people are suspicious. Some people. You know, there are some people, they cry and they make themselves cry. There's a thing in Islam where the Prophet said, when you read the Quran, try to make yourself cry if you don't cry. Someone may be giving a talk and he starts crying. I know someone who told some people, I can teach you how to cry when you're giving the talk. Some people, they're suspicious when you hear the crying of Al-Albani. Allah knows best. Everyone's near. Al-Albani and other than Al-Albani. But you get a feeling that this is a man of ikhlas. This is a man of ikhlas. One of his students, his name is Zuhair. He's our Samira Zuhairi. He's present right now. He did some serious works 
in the different books of Al Hadith. He said that he knew a man who was an enemy of Al Albani, vehemently opposed to him, nasty. He was swearing and cursing about Al Albani. The Sheikh Sami, who's a student, said, Look, do you know the Sheikh? He said, I don't know him. He said, Well, the Sheikh is beyond and higher than being spoken about like this by you, and you don't even know him. But I'm going to have a dinner. You can come and you can meet the Sheikh. He said that he invited a number of students of knowledge that came to the dinner, and he never told the Sheikh about that man's presence in the dinner. He said that the man overwhelmed the assembly by talking, and he was very aggressive. He was known as being aggressive, overwhelming, overpowering in the way that he put his point across. He said that he and Albani started to discuss, and the man was rough and tough, but the man found that an Albani was easy. The owner of the house, the host, the Sheikh Samir, he said, I became embarrassed and angry the way he was dealing with the Sheikh who was my guest. He said that the Sheikh said to me, don't worry, don't worry, take it easy. So they begin to discuss. The man who was rough and tough and opposed to Al-Albani saw he couldn't deal with his delil and he couldn't deal with his adab, with the way he behaved. At the end of the discussion, at the end of the discussion, the man said to Al-Albani, Alhamdulillah, I met you after, after you changed. Because what I heard was, you never accept the truth and you're, you're, you're a person who's stubborn. And Al-Albani said, I didn't change. Here's a man who's been with me for 20 years. Ask him, I, I am who I am. You ever met me before to say that I changed? The man said, no. He said, I never changed. He said, but I ask you by Allah to forgive me if I've hurt you in any way. And he started crying in front of the people. The man started crying. That man became Salafi as a result of that. And he became from the students of Al-Imam Al-Albani, who were well known during this time. So from his Salafiyya Ikhwani is that the man had an easy heart. Rahim, anyone who listens to those tapes, the young boy would call Al-Imam Al-Albani and say, Sheikh, I'm young, I just started uh, practicing, and I hear that you hang up the phone on people. Don't hang up the phone on me. The Sheikh started laughing and said, Wallahi, I won't hang up the phone on you. And he started discussing, and the boy was not understanding he wasn't understanding. The sheikh was trying to talk to him. And he wasn't understanding the points. But the sheikh was just gentle and easy with him. The tape is famous. Over one hour, one hour he, indulged him. he indulged the boy. And that's how he was with the people. Rahimahullah ta'ala. And Albani's love for the sunnah and his hatred for innovation. His love for the sunnah and his hatred for innovation. When he was living in Saudi Arabia... He was driving on the highway in Jeddah. One of the things that people know about him is that he drives his car very, very fast. People used to complain to him about it, criticize him and advise him, don't drive your car like that. He was a fast driver. And he used to tell him, don't drive your car like that. He had an accident, his car tipped over, could have died. In Saudi Arabia, more people died in car accidents than anything else. When the people came to help him, he didn't die. They were saying something that's a famous statement of the Arabs. If something happens that's bad, the Arabs say, Ya Satir, Ya Satir, which means, Oh Allah, Ya Satir. Allah Azza wa Jalla, He covers up. May Allah conceal, cover you up from being harmed. May Allah protect you. If the lady sees her child about to grab the ball in water, the, ch the mother will say, Ya Satir. To stop the child, like it's istighada with Allah. Ya Allah. So when they came up to the Sheikh, he's upside down in an accident. When they came to see what was happening, Sheikh Muhammad Nasr al Din al Albani told the people, don't say Ya Satir, Ya Satir. Say Ya Satir. Satir is not a name of Allah. Allah is a Satir. Then he told him the hadith of the Nabi Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam and he's upside down in a car that could have killed him. Bi'idhnillah, he told him the hadith that the Nabi told the people Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam Inna Allah satir wa yuhibbu satir Fa'idha ikhtasala ahadakum fal yastatir Allahu Ta'ala is satir, not satir. Satir. He loves it when you conceal the faults of people. He loves it when you conceal your own aura. He loves it when you conceal your issues, your mashakal, whatever. Satir, not satir. 
So if one of you, if one of you takes a ghusl, then cover up yourselves and don't walk around naked. The point here, the point here is in a situation like that, who's going to be teaching hadith and the person is almost dying? I saw a YouTube clip the other day about some imam in Tunis. It's one of those reality programs, I guess, where they play jokes and practical jokes on people. He was an imam and they were interviewing him, supposedly interviewing him. And the people in the studio made the earthquake come. It wasn't a real earthquake. They started making the shake, the, the desk shake, and things started falling. And this guy was in on the joke. He had a beard. He looked like a proper sheikh. He didn't panic. He started making the dhikr of Allah. If you put this in the YouTube, Tunis Imam and earthquake. He didn't panic. If that was really an earthquake, the way he acted at that time, it would have been praiseworthy. Because most people will lose their brain and go crazy. He started making the dhikr of Allah Azza wa Jal. People of Iman and Allah Ta'ala, people of knowledge, people of taqwa, they're the ones in moments like that, their reality comes out. He has a problem. He doesn't result to losing his mind. He doesn't result to becoming emotional. And Al-Bani, that was his case. Rahimahullah ta'ala. His love for the sunnah. Al-Imam Al-Albani. You said it in the khutbah. The man said a hadith of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Talking about the condition of the believers. He said, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that the believers are like a solid cemented structure. They solidify each other. And then he put his fingers like that. To show that we have to support each other, help each other, love each other, accommodate one, one another. It's not he's over there and I'm over there. Tremendous hadith. The man in the khutbah, he mentioned that hadith. The example of the believers is like a solid cemented structure. The bricks intertwine and they solidify and help one another. And then the Nabi put his fingers like this to show the people. But the narrator of the hadith added on a word that the Nabi didn't say in the khutbah. Sallallahu alayhi wasallam. After the khutbah, Imam al-Albani got up and he mentioned, no, this is not correct. And he started in a nice way telling the people what the right hadith, the wording of the hadith was. When you'll find many people in a situation like that, finding every excuse not to talk. And those examples of khwani are many. Many. Like the issue of standing up for people who come in. When Al-Albani was in Saudi Arabia, from the practice of the Saudi Arabian society is anyone of prominence, if they come in, everyone has to stand up. And if you don't stand up, people are going to get upset with you. It's a sign of disrespect not to stand up. That's not only in Arabia, that's in most cultures. And it's something that came to the Muslims from the Ajim, the non-Arabs and the non-Muslims. So there are some hadith where the Prophet told us, don't stand up for people. He said, anyone who wants people to stand up for him, let him prepare his place in the hellfire. Authentic hadith. In the Adab al mufrad of Imam al-Bukhari. Man ahab al-Nas. An yatamathil lahu qiyamin. Fal yatabawa maqadu min al nar Anyone who expects and wants people to stand up for him, he wants it. Gets upset if you don't. The Prophet said, let him prepare his place in the hellfire. Abdullah ibn Abbas said, when the Prophet would come in, وسلم, we would not stand up for him because we knew that he hated it. So the companions didn't stand up for anyone. This is what the Romans did. This is what the Persians did. And Al-Bani used to take issues like that and used to spread them out to the people and let the people know about them. In Arabia, wherever he was, the prince comes in, the king comes in, the scholar comes in, the rich person comes in, the people stand up, he didn't stand up. He didn't stand up. When it came to his turn, they shook hands, whatever. If the person wanted to know and they gave him the opportunity to speak, he explained it without apologizing. Now, of course, he didn't do it in a way which was abrasive. He didn't do it in a way in which it turned people away from him. He gave the people the opportunity to ask. And once they asked and he opened his mouth, you're going to listen to the way he talks. You're going to listen to the way he puts his dawah across. That's the Salafi of Al-Albani. Those of you. You have to go to the janazah of your relative. Should you go? Should you not go? You have to determine that. You have to go to the nikah of your relative. Should you go? Should you not go? You have to determine that. 
if you decide to go, validate your presence and give dawa in a nice way. Don't make the dawa come across in a nasty way. Do you know how many people hated Al Albani because of the Salafi people? They don't know the man. A Salafi was in France in the 90s. The prominent scholar of a Salafi in France, Al Albani. Many of the French people, Muslims, Algerians, many of them hated Al Albani, not because they knew him, but because of the rough, tough position of some of the brothers and sisters who were claiming Salafiyah. The Sheikh suffers. Prophet Muhammad suffers, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, because of the way the Muslims behave in the world and things that we do. So the love of the Sunnah that Al Albani had, I'm telling you, anyone who's exposed to those tapes, you'll hear him eating with the people. You'll hear him. At the house of the, the host, at the house, he'll say to the host, you hear his voice saying, Ya Abu Fulan, eat with your right hand, don't eat with your left hand. All the time, he's talking to the people and explaining things of Sunnah. Now, there's someone who may say, ah. in Syria, the people are being killed. In Egypt, the people are being killed. And Al Albani is talking about the right hand, left hand. That's because you minimize the sunnah. You minimize the sunnah. And Al Albani, he makes the sunnah really important. And those little sunnahs that you're seeing as being insignificant, if you, if you can't acknowledge those, how are you going to acknowledge the things that are bigger and more important? Like the sunnah of put an emphasis on a tawheed. Like the sunnah of practicing the religion the way that the companions practice it. Radiallahu anhu. Like the sunnah of all of those other aspects of al-Islam. So his love for the sunnah was well known. Another issue, Ikhwani, is the generosity of al-Albani. Al-Albani came from a poor home in Albania. And as he grew up, his father made watches and he made watches after his father he did some carpentry in between there but he was miskeen but as he started to write he started to make some money he won the king Faisal award and he received quite a large sum of money but his books his books were some of the most wanted and sought after books in the marketplace so he began to make some money Al Albani didn't keep that money. He wasn't a stingy person. Just like Al Imam Ibn Baz, who we saw with our own eyes. The African man come up to him and he needed some help. He was a student of knowledge. He wanted to get back to his country. And he said something in the ear of the Sheikh without looking at because he can't see the money. He just goes in his pocket, give the boy all of the money that he had. That's how those ulama were. Al Albani became sick. The lady came to him in the hospital. At that time, he's sick. He's going to die. The lady said, I owe the bank 9,000 dinar. I took a loan, and now the loan is killing me, and the interest of the loan is killing me. Can I borrow from you some money? The sheikh sent one of his students, Hamid al-Khatib, go find out the reality of her story. He found out that the reality was as she said. Al-Albani gave the lady 7,000 dinar, 7,000 dinar as a loan. The lady came back to the hospital with her children to thank him. She was happy. He gave her a thousand dinar and told the lady, this is an addition, it's just for you, a hadiyah. When she left, he said to the students who were there, he said, I wish that Allah Ta'ala would make me a millionaire so that I can save a hundred women like this from the riba of the banks. So his generosity and the examples of his students the student who comes to him in his mektaba, he used to need people to write for him because he got old. So this student will come and he will write for him a few days and he brought with him a book. And then Benny said, let me see the book that you have. The student is nervous. Is he going to look at the book and criticize me for having this book and so forth and so on? He took the book and he went inside and left the boy, the man in his library. He came out some time later in the day. He was still in his library. He gave him back the book. The man left. He found in the book 1,000 dinar. And those examples that his students mentioned about him are many, many for the students as well as for those individuals who just came to him in need. He was an individual who was 
generous. The ibadah of Al Imam Al Albani. Al Albani performed 35 Hajj in Al Islam. 35 in Al Islam. His students said that he used to make Qiyam al Layl and they would stay with him just to make Qiyam al Layl. In the Qiyam al Layl, he would do it different ways. Sometimes in the Qiyam al Layl, he would make Salat and he would make Rukur for 20 minutes. He would make Sajda for 20 minutes. He would make the Qiyam and recitation for 45 minutes to an hour because that was the Sunnah. Sometimes he wouldn't do it that long. Sometimes it would just be normal and anyone can handle it. Sometimes it would be very long. One of his students in the process would want him to slow down. So the student would come to him while they're waiting. After the Salat, two rakats, he's making dhikr, which is the sunnah. Before you do the rest of the prayers, the student, he wants a reprieve. So what he does, he thinks he's smart. He comes to ask the imam about an issue. And Imam al-Albani said, now is not the time for knowledge. Now is the time for ibadah. And then they get up and they make those prayers. Many people cannot continue that with them. The point, Ikhwani, is the man was rahimahullahu ta'ala ta the embodiment of being an imam yuqtada bihi, a person who can be followed. So his love for the sunnah, spread of the sunnah, his application of the sunnah, his call to the sunnah, his rahimahullahu ta'ala hatred for innovation. He used to say, I sometimes wish, he was teaching the people one of the hadith of the Nabi sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that he said, A'mar ummati ma bayna sitin wa sabaeen wa qililu man yujawazu dhalika. The age of my ummah, the Prophet said, is that the majority of the people will live between 60 and 70 years old. 60 and 70. And the minority of them will pass 70. The Prophet uh, Al Albani said, I am from that minority. He was 83 at the time. He said, I pass 70. I hope Allah put barakah in my life and so forth and so on. He said, but because of much of the innovation that I see in the ummah that has been taken as the sunnah, the shirk in the ummah that has been taken as tawheed, sometimes I wish that I would die. He said, but after knowing the hadith of the Nabi, sallallahu alayhi wa let not any of you wish for death. لا يتمنين أحدكم الموت لمصيبة أصيب بها. None of you should wish to die because of something that happened to you. But if you have to make that du'a, then say, Oh Allah, if death is better for me, then bring it. And if living is better for me, then bring it. So his dislike for what the community, the ummah has become in terms of understanding of this religion. In the masajid of the sunnah, in the masajid of the sunnah, there's innovation. Innovation. That people of the sunnah are understanding this is religion. Loving people and hating people based upon fiqh positions. There's an innovation in the deen of Allah Azza wa Jal. And other than that. So he was a man who Allah Ta'ala blessed. If you want to know, especially in English, the love that he had for the sunnah, just look at the works that the man put forward in terms of the sunnah. I even spend the rest of the time naming all of the books. But everybody, the people are iyal on al-albani. Just like in fiqh, everyone owes a debt of gratitude to al-imam Abu Hanifa. No matter what your madhab is, you owe a debt of gratitude to al-imam Abu Hanifa. Al-imam al-albani, if you're trying to worship Allah today based upon the sunnah, you're trying to learn your religion based upon the kitab and the sunnah, you're going to have a level of debt to him. Took care of the six books of hadith. The most important books. He took care of them. Mukhtasar of Sahih Bukhari and Muslim. He made Sahih Abu Dawood Da'if. All of those books. Sahih Da'if. at targhib wa Tarheeb by Ibn al-Mundhir. Important book. Took care of that. Riyadh al-Salihin. All of those books of hadith. Irwal al-Ghalil. You want to know how to make Umrah, you want to know how to make Hajj, you want to know how to make Salat according to the Sunnah. As if you saw the Nabi, Al-Albani brought that stuff. The book, Fiqh Sunnah, a well-read book, well-known, comparative Fiqh, all of those issues. And he came up with a project, a mashru'ah. He called it 
تقريب السنة بين أيدي الأمة bringing the sunnah close to the hands of the ummah bringing the sunnah there are a lot of things in the sunnah that are out there we can't grab it how did the prophet pray I'm going to learn from my madhab I told you many times when I became a Muslim we had to learn from some of our brothers from the Hanafi madhab from Jamaat Tabliq and other than that we used to do what they told us to do and it was difficult what they were telling us to do and it wasn't even based upon proofs that we can reference those things back and that's the religion and the salah of many people that's the hajj of many people that's the hijab of many people and Imam Al-Albani came up 60 years ago with a project I'm going to bring the sunnah and make it mutanawila, put it in the hands of the average person of the sunnah. So he writes a book about the hijab of the Muslim girl. So he took care of just in a simple way, letting this ummah know about the aqidah of al-Islam. Aqidah, al-aqidah, tahawiyah. That book of aqidah, and al-Bani took that book and he brought the ahadith, the taqreej and the hukum of the hadith, the ruling and the explanation of that tremendously beneficial and important book. Kitab al-Iman ibn Abi Shayba. Al-Imam al-Bani brought that. Kitab al-Iman by Ibn Taymiyyah. Kitab al-Ilm. All of those books. Wallahi, ikhwani. The love that the people had for al-Bani, as I mentioned, without any ghulu. Ghulu is not okay for anyone. But if a person had a library, my brother Yusuf is a student in Al-Medina, Anik is going to go to be a student. Liban is a student there in Al-Medina. That brother Adil is a student in the Riyadh. You start developing your library. You start developing. Books can go in different parts of your library. One book can go in different parts of your library. Some books clearly go in the Hadith section. Some clearly go in the Fiqh section. Some can go here or there. And then there's a section you don't know where to put the book sometimes. So you have a section where the books I don't know where to put them at. So I have a section, these are the books I don't know where to put them at. If you made for yourself a corner in your library, the books of an Albani, irregardless of what the subject is, the corner of Rukun Al Albani, Al Albani corner, you wouldn't have done an injustice. You wouldn't have done an injustice. Al Albani did not allow people to kiss his hand to kiss his head out of respect he used to push people away and being Albanian he was strong he wasn't out of shape he was old he used to push him away some of the students with love for the sunnah here's a hand you're making a fist man which one are you going to do here's a hand that wrote the sunnah for 60 years 60 years and that student is a student of the sunnah and hadith he doesn't want to go overboard. He wants to kiss the hand. And the Libani is pulling away. Just as much as he wants to pull it away, that student is saying, it deserves to be kissed. It's the hand that wrote the sunnah. That's how those students used to be with Al-Imam and Al-Bani. used to fight them. Now, now, we have situations where the sheikh, if you don't do that with him, he's upset with you. If you don't take his position, he's upset with you. He's upset with you. He warns. You better take my position. I'm going to do this to you. No. Al-Imam Ibn Baz, Al-Imam Ibn Uthaymeen, Al-Imam Al-Albani, Al-Imam Al-Sheikh Muqbil. These people were not like that. They were murabbiyun, murabbiyun. They used to give tarbiyah to the people, to the kitab and the sunnah without any taqlid al-a'ma and without any taqdis of the ashkhaz. The shiyukh who were hearing their names today being put up there like that. They don't deserve that. They deserve respect. But we didn't find an Albani and those people being looked at. And they deserved it. They didn't allow that. And now it's something that's being called to. We're going to stop here, Ikhwani. Go to the internet and Google and put in the internet the last will and testament of an Albani. And look what that man wrote two weeks before his death. What he wanted the people to do when he died. And you'll see a man of the sunnah two weeks before he died. Just look at the sunnah and the hadith and the clarity and the love and the rahmah that he had for his children and the people and his students. And Imam had a library that will fill this masjid up. He could have given that library to any of his students. He didn't give it to his students. Maybe they're going to be upset with each other. 
He didn't give it to me. He didn't get, who's going to give it to? What did he do? He gave that library. He didn't give it to his children. They were benefiting. He didn't give it to them. He gave it to the University of Medina because the university benefited him. Just look at his last will and testament. We ask Allah Ta'ala with his ism and adham to establish Al-Imam Al-Albani upon the Kitab and to have rahmah on Al-Imam Al-Albani and to forgive him for any of the indiscretion, the mistakes that he made and that he put him, puts him in the Jannah al firdaus And for your information, Al-Albani, he came to this masjid. He went to Spain and he came to the UK. 30 years ago or something like this, when this masjid first started, he was sent here by Sheikh Ibn Baz. So this masjid has a history of having qualified and bona fide ulama who have come. And al-kamal is only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Subhanak Allahumma wa bihamdika wa shadu an la ilaha ila ant. Astaghfiruka wa tubu ilayk. Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullah wa barakatuh. أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم